Singularity folks. Welcome to Connect E-Commerce and Web Development, the pitch competition that brings together leading members of the media with the most innovative startups in the e-commerce and web development space. My name is Jim Glade, and I'm a partner at Publicize, which is a PR firm for growth. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Siobhan Parnell and Salome Muriel, who helped organize today's event. We're really pleased to be joined today by a host of leading journalists who report in the fields of startups, technology, business, and e-commerce. And we're equally happy to host five very exciting startups offering innovative e-commerce and web development solutions across a range of industries, and they'll pitch their ventures in front of these distinguished media judges. Uh, we'll also be holding a live Q&A session at the end with the media judges, so all of the attendees, as well as the startups that are pitching today, if you have any questions uh, in terms of media best practices for, um, for the journalist panel, it's a really great place to get some valuable insights at the end, so stick around for that. Um, to get us in the mood for today's competition, we have a very special guest. Sajid Mohammadi is an Executive Vice President of Growth and Development at NISM, a leading technology consulting partner based in California that builds custom digital commerce solutions for leading companies like Walmart, Airbnb, Major League Baseball, uh, and many others. Sajid has a uh, seasoned strategy and professional uh, an accomplished entrepreneur, boasting a proven track record of successfully creating and expanding enterprises. With comprehensive expertise in business planning, entrepreneurship, marketing analytics, international growth, mergers and acquisitions, venture capital, and market analysis, he has consistently demonstrated exceptional business acumen. Prior to Nissim, Sajid launched a startup uh, named Colibri um, in the solar industry and worked as a management consultant for EY as well as Mercer. Uh, Sajid received his MBA from UCLA Anderson, a, a dual BA uh, degrees as well in economics and political science from UCLA. And he's currently a mentor at the UCLA Anderson Venture Accelerator and also serves as, as an advisor and investor to multiple startups. His education and background have equipped him with the skills and knowledge required to thrive in today's ever-changing business landscape. And he has applied this knowledge to great effect in all of his endeavors. He lives with his wife and three children in Los Angeles and enjoys traveling to places where he doesn't know the language. So Sajit, if, if you don't know Spanish, welcome you down here to Colombia anytime, but welcome uh, to the Connect event and thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Jim. That's uh, that was a really um, generous uh, <laughs> intro. I see. I see. Our marketing team has been in touch with you, so thank you for that. Uh, I've been to Colombia. Actually, my honeymoon was in Colombia. Love that place. I have a great association with it. Um, so my name, as Jim said, is Sajid Mohammadi. I'm the EVP of Growth and Delivery at Nissim. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank public for hosting this uh, this great competition. Uh, I think it's so important for uh, the venture community. I also want to thank the judges for taking the time to support these startups. Uh, and personally, I'm very excited to, to be here and hear from uh, today's entrepreneurs. Being an entrepreneur is truly one of the hardest things you can do professionally. So, you know, I've been in your shoes a couple of times and totally get it. Uh, so I commend you all. I wish you all luck today and really look forward to seeing your journeys uh, ahead. Uh, and on the topic of journeys, uh, I've asked to share a little bit about Nissim's journey uh, as a, you know, what we like to think of ourselves as a 23-year-old entrepreneurial startup company. So before Nissim was founded, imagine it's the 90s, e-commerce e is booming, venture capital cap uh, money is absolutely flowing, uh, and our founder, his name is Umtiaz, uh, is an executive at one of these hot startups, it's called eToys. Uh, they're worth over a billion dollars, um, and this is the 90s, so a billion dollars is, I mean, imagine a unicorn 25 years ago. Um, and they have these really ambitious goals, uh, similar to another hot startup at the time that we all know and a lot of us love, Amazon. Um, they wanted to also become an everything store the way Amazon has. Uh, so they're really at the cutting edge of technology, of e-commerce, but of course we know uh, what happens next, the dot-com bubble bursted and eToys went under 
And um, like so many others, they're kind of forgotten. But through this experience as an e-commerce pioneer, um, seeing this explosive rise and subsequent fall uh, of those companies back then, Imtiaz, our founder, uh, started Nissim. Uh, but with a very different kind of philosophy than most of the startups uh, at the time or even what we see today. He wasn't building a business for VCs. He wasn't building a business for attention or hype uh, or ignoring profitability. Not to say those things are not important, but he was really building Nissim with the tenets of investing in our people, uh, always doing what's right for our customers, for our employees, taking care of our communities, maintaining a longer term view on the business. So we've even adopted uh, this motto. We, we have uh, this motto, it's building success together. And each of these three words, you know, while, while it, might, it might come off as cliche if you hear it really fast, each of these three words for us, it's really uh, carries a lot of weight uh, and has deep meaning and informs everything we try to do ensuring that we never really lose focus on what's important to our people, our partners, our clients, our clients, customers, and also our communities. And today, fast forwarding, you know, 23 years, and this one was founded in the year 2000, uh, we're really proud of the contributions we've made in building truly the modern digital economy. The technology we've built has uh, enabled hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions, and healthcare services for our clients every single year, uh, all while placing this emphasis on being um, human-centric uh, in, in every experience that we enable. And we partner with some of the most innovative brands and startups to really improve the way their customers and their patients shop, live, access healthcare, even play. Uh, just in the past few years since uh, COVID, our work has allowed us to really drive you know, life-changing initiatives. So uh, from launching the first virtual vaccine appointment scheduler for a major American pharma pharmacy during the height of the pandemic, if you guys remember how tough it was to get vaccine appointments, you know, there was so much uh, uh, kind of ambiguity around it. So, so, so creating uh, those experiences to providing millions of meals for underprivileged communities in Asia, also during the height of the pandemic, to fast forwarding a little bit as um, we started coming out to a sense of normalcy, um, creating uh, ticketing experiences for the Major League Baseball where families could come together and, and kind of share this kind of core American experience, right? Of going to a, a baseball game and having a, uh, a sense of normalcy again. So there's so many more stories like that, but you know, suffice to say, we've really reaped the benefits of being people-centric and long-term focused. And beyond fueling kind of extraordinary uh, customer, customer innovation, we really pride ourselves on being citizens of the world, committed to giving back, building sustainable communities, providing mentorship and opportunities that, that need them most. So for example, in Latin America, uh, you know, you mentioned Colombia, we're also, we have offices in Colombia today, as well as Chile. Uh, we founded a nonprofit called Codea. It's doing amazing work to train women and girls for careers in tech. And today it's internationally recognized for the work that they do. We also fund innovative startups for our venture efforts and uh, especially those that maintain these shared values that I just mentioned. And that's why I'm especially excited about today. We know there's a lot going on in the news with, uh, with uh, the tech community, layoffs, uh, the banking situation, but I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities that come out of all of this, just the same way uh, we saw when this was started 23 years ago. So if there's anything you take away from you know, what I've just shared and our journey, it would be to put people at the heart of really everything you do. Tech is the easy part, uh, but people can really be your secret sauce. Uh, always focus on what's truly right for your employees, your customers, and building businesses for purpose, not necessarily for VCs. So with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Jim. Thank you again, uh, and good luck to all the presenters. Sajid, thank you so much uh, for, for those great words. And also congratulations on everything that you guys have built. Um, you know, I, I think uh, for a lot of these startups, maybe in uh, uh, another 10, 20 years, 
um, they'll be in the same position and they'll be presenting here as well. So um, just thank you so much. If there's, um, I, I wanted to ask if, if you're willing, if you wanted to share um, um, any contact information, if anybody from the panel would like to get in touch with you as well, um, uh, or, or contact information or a website for NISM as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the website is nisum.com, N-I-S-U-M dot com. Uh, my contact information is my first name at nisum.com. So Sajid that N-I-S-U-M dot com. I'm sure I can I can have it shared through uh, uh, through Lynn, who's on my team and and on this uh, panel with uh, with all the participants. But Fantastic. I'd love to connect with 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 the people here. Sounds Thanks. good. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Sajid, for your words. And uh, uh, if you can stick around, please feel free to. We'd love to have you. I know you're super busy if you have to hop off as well. So thanks again, Sajid. All right, folks. Um, well, let's hop right into uh, inter introducing our media judges. Uh, folks, when I say your name, if you could come on and, and say a quick hello so we can put a face to a bio, that would be fantastic. Um, first up, joining us again, we have uh, Ivan Mehta, who is a technology reporter for TechCrunch, one of the leading technology news publications. He covers all things AI, India, internet culture, security, software, ecosystems, big tech, you name it, he covers it. Uh, before joining TechCrunch, Ivan was a writer for The Next Web, which is a leading technology news publication and events company owned by the Financial Times. And before that, he also covered tech for The Huffington Post. So thank you, Yvonne, for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's always a pleasure. Um, for his first time with us, and we hope not his last, we have uh, Victor Day, who is the tech editor at VentureBeat, um, one of the leading media publications covering the latest technology uh, transforming industry. He reports on artificial intelligence, data science, cybersecurity, much, much more. Uh, prior to joining VentureBeat, Victor wrote for other important uh, tech publications, including Analytics India Magazine. With a background in data science and analytics, he brings unique insights to his coverage each day. So Victor, it's a pleasure to have you with us, sir. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here and all the best to everyone uh, pitching today. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Gina Sharma, who is a retail reporter at Morning Brew, a daily e-newsletter covering the latest in business news. She's also worked for um, a diverse range of publications across the world, including the New York Observer, South China Morning Post, Harper's Bazaar, Dazed, Vice, Broadly, Vogue India, uh, just to name a few. She writes everywhere um, and very prolific. So Gina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I think uh, this is our first reporter for uh, an e-newsletter to, to join one of our um, uh, Connect events as well. So uh, it's a milestone. So thank you very much, Gina, for being that person. Yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mark Rowan, who is a senior vice president, B2B and market research at Digital Commerce 360, a leading media and research organization that delivers objective news and competitive data across e-retailing, B2B e-commerce, and digital healthcare. He covers the latest trends and news in e-commerce, retail, marketing, and much, much more. Mark, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you. I, I like to say that dinosaurs roam the earth because I was around when, when eToys was founded when they folded. And I go back to the beginning of all this way, way back. Uh, I found Internet Retailer Magazine, and then for 15 years, we have ranked 6,000 online retailers on every aspect of what they do for the better part of 20 years. So yeah, we do e-commerce publishing, and I keep doing it because I love it. So thank you for having me. Well, we couldn't have had a better uh, uh, person here for the, for the Connect e-commerce event. So Mark, thank you so much for taking time. Um, Navanita Sachdev is the editor of The Tech Panda, a digital publication exploring technology's impact on Indian lives and its ties with business and the economy. Navanita, Navanita also frequently publishes stories in leading news outlets such as the Indian Express, Hindustan Times, Entrepreneur India, and the Business Standard, one of the country's most well-respected business news publications. So Navanita, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Jim. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you back. Uh, and last but not least, 
we have Stephanie Trancoso, who is a contributor at Entrepreneur Magazine in Espanol, a leading publication covering entrepreneurialism, small business management, and business opportunities for the Spanish-speaking world. She's also a regular contributor to Social Geek, one of the leading technology uh, media organizations in Latin America, as well as Pulso, which is Colombia's largest digital news outlet with over 9 million readers per month. Uh, she's also an account executive for us here at Publicize. So, Stefania, it's really great to have you on as well. Hi, Jim. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, again, uh, I'd like to say thank you for all of the journalists for taking time out of their day. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and start the pitch competition. Startups, I'll bring you on and pass you the presenter role. You'll be able to share your screen if you'd like. Um, you'll be presenting for two minutes and I will be timing you. I'll give you a heads up at about the 10 second. It's from the media panel and uh, judges, please feel free to um, just call out. It's very informal. Uh, call out or raise your hand uh, for questions um, and feedback as well. We, we really love feedback uh, for these um, startups who are pitching today. So the first founder we'll bring on is Paul, uh, Paul Clavel, co-founder and CEO of Flappin. Paul, give me one second and I'll pass you the presenter role, sir. Okay, thanks. All right, you should be able to share your screen, Paul. Yes, I can. I'm sharing it. Okay, cool. Um, and it looks like we can see it now and hear you loud and clear. So whenever you are ready, I'll start the timer. All right, I'm ready. Let's go. Relaxion, Jim. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul, co-founder of Flapping. And we're on a mission to revolutionize the way people book and give travel and leisure experiences. And I'm excited to share our story with you today. Picture this, you're scrolling through countless options to plan your next trip or find the perfect gift, but nothing seems to send out. Sounds familiar? This is a problem that many of us face in today's complex and overwhelming travel market. People today suffer from the complexity and the number of options available when planning a trip or choosing the ideal gift. And even having a wide range of options available, most agencies offer from similar products and compete for the lowest price. And this is frustrating for consumers who are looking to add value to their trips and not just opt for the lowest price. And at Flapping, we solve this issue. Our platform introduces a new concept of surprise, simplifying the chaos of travel and tourism. We provide personalized surprise trips gifts and experiences that help young people enjoy unique experiences while reducing the time and effort it takes to plan. But why surprise? Because we believe that the best memories are made when we step out of our comfort zone and try something new. Our platform makes it easy to just do that. You simply choose your package, customize your experience, and two days before your trip, we reveal your destination and accommodation along with a trip guide. Now, you may be wondering how we capture value. Our business model is flexible, with half of our sales coming from direct bookings and the other half from gift sales. Gifts are redeemed on average six months after purchase, allowing us to control cash flows and have local pressure. Additionally, a percentage of them are never redeemed, transforming it into free cash. The problem is global in a huge growing wide open market, and Flapping is poised to be the dominant leader in the space for young generations. In the next five years, we're scaling our DTC brand into Europe to become the top brand for Gen Z and millennials. Join us on this surprising adventure to live more and plan less. Thank you for your time. All right, fantastic. Paul, um, and just on time as well. So thank you very much. Uh, not bad uh, for those that you that are uh, watching in. Uh, this was Paul's first time pitching in a competition like this, but I think you did great, Paul. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we'll open up for questions and comments from the media panel. Please feel free to just unmute and ask questions as uh, as you'd like. I'm not sure, if Victor or Stefania, anybody want to go first? 
give me give me in, in two in, in two answers what makes you truly unique to me as a consumer where I would go online and trust my money with your brand. How are All you right. so unique that I'm going to do that? I saw so I we are going to solve your problem of looking and looking through countless options available on the travel market uh, and to find the perfect gift that everyone is stressed out and have difficulty to find it because you're not going to choose either your destination nor your hotel. We're going to choose it for you, but we know what you know and you want to do. So basically, we're going to solve all the problem of planning. And we're offering you the best experience that we know that you're going to love. Um, what what are these recommendations uh, based on? Um, how do you know the consumer is going to like it? Through our personalization on the booking process, we have a lot of data from the user. So based on user preferences, we can uh, choose the ideal hotel, the ideal flight, the ideal restaurant, or the ideal wellness or adventure activity. And it's going to be, in the end, less expensive than if I were to go through a travel agency? You would, you would spend so much time looking for that price uh that it's not uh it's it, it, it that is not worth it for you actually uh we have better prices than you're gonna find on the market okay thank you no problem Yvonne, yeah. Please go ahead. Sorry. yeah uh can you just give me an example of like what is what kind of surprise that you're talking about Yes, so the surprise is the destination itself, the hotel, and the full experience because you don't choose. You choose what you want to do. So you know that you want to travel. You know that you want to, for example, travel to a surprise or to a uh, beach or to a disconnection getaway. Okay, so you can choose what you want, but you're not going to choose actually where it's going to be. Okay, so the surprise is going to be the destination and the full hotel and all the experiences that you book through your booking process. But, but can this also be like international travel? Yes. Or is it only local? We, we have national, domestic, and international travel all around Europe for now. OK, thank you. No problem. Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting with what you do, and I wanted to ask if you have any thoughts on expanding, like where your plans in that field. Oh, sorry, can you ask again, please? Yeah, I wanted to know uh, what are your next steps uh, when it comes to expanding your business. Yes, so uh, yes, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, next month we're launching Italy and Portugal here in Europe. Uh, on the next five years, we're going to be in eleven countries uh, in Europe, and then we're going to jump to the US or Latin. Nice, thank you. No problem. I saw uh, Yvonne with your hand up too, if you still had a question or if it got answered. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I wanted to understand what's the gift part that you said. It, it's not clear if the gift is travel, gift is an experience. What am I getting at? Yes, here on the, the gift part is that every package we have on the website can be booked for you or you can gift it to other people. Okay, so we're talking about the experiential gifts market. Here in Europe, it's very well known. There's a lot of uh, old players that are, are not doing so well on the digital side. Uh, so here we created uh, our platform where you can either book, either it's a trip, a restaurant, or a food experience, adventure, uh, but you can also gift it to other people and you can gift it to different formats. Got it. I mean, it, I feel it's just easier to say gift it for someone then, then just label it as a product because I thought that you know you're you're trying to be a gifting platform as well as trial platform. It was a bit confusing. Yeah, it's not the typical gifting platform like yeah, with yeah. all based. This. We have experiential gifts, so uh, people are uh, are better having uh, experiential gifts rather than material gifts. As a and, and what what part of uh, what what part of business what percentage of business does the gifts bring in it's half 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 direct booking half gift sales yeah 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask one thing. Um, see, in this kind of uh, experience, customer support would play a major, major role. So can you explain your emphasis on that? Oh, can you ask again, please? Uh, I, I said, can you explain your emphasis on customer support? Like while the people are traveling, why are you making this experience? How are you supporting that customer's journey? Uh, so basically we uh, are very close to our customers always because they need to be uh, very like uh, trusted by us because uh, it's a surprise, right? Um, the surprise is good when it's good, but it's not that good when it's not good. So people should be very like uh, uh, be very trusted from our brand, um, and we have a lot of contact points with the with the customer before uh, the trip. So two days before you get all your flights, your accommodations, and everything. But before we are contacting you to let you know that we're preparing your trip and everything. I'm not sure if I answer your question right. No, that's good. Yeah. All righty, Paul. Well, uh, just to be conscious of time, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next. But Paul, again, congratulations on a great first presentation uh, at a startup pitch competition, sir. Thank you, Jim. All right. We'll move on to our next presenter. Uh, we have Wenula, who's the founder and CEO of Tunza. Wenula, give me one second and I will pass you the presenter role, sir. Thank you. All righty, you should be able to share your screen now if you'd like. Let me know if you can see. Yes, sir, we can see the screen. Uh, it's not in the presenter mode, but um, but we can see the slides, just as a heads up. Oh, one second, let me set it to presenter. Okay. Is it? There we go, yep. So whenever you're ready, uh, when you look, go ahead and start and I'll start the timer. Great. Um, I'm Winula from Tunza Fintech. And I think um, I've, I've read most of um, stories from um, journalists when they speak about the uh, negative side of buy now, pay later. And I agree with you, no more buy now, pay later, please. And <clears throat> I'm from Africa and there's like 300 million earners in Africa who are struggling with achieving financial goals because of low purchasing power, poor financial habits and high interest rates. And they are going for traditional banks, personal finance and buy now pay later, which is really not working uh, for most of them. We started to look at um, alternative models to uh, uh, for buy now pay later. Um, and we came upon this model and Tunza Let's unbank African consumers save for, purchase, for purchases from a curated marketplace of trusted merchants with the secure savings and payments APIs. We are completely the opposite of buy now, pay later. And why are we doing this? Because um, first of all, we want to make um, tech accessible to Africans. Also, we, want, we are building a transparent platform to give Africans freedom to choose how they want to pay without falling into debt. And Tunza is quite simple. People come to our, our product uh, as a marketplace, and then they see a product, they set when they want to pay for it, they start to pay, and as soon as they finish the payments, then they get the product delivered. On the other side, we are building um, solutions for businesses, and also our product works offline for non-smartphone users, so that's pretty cool, especially in Africa. And yes, we are making money from commissions from the sales that we do. In the future, we are planning to make money from transactions and in-app in ads. We are looking at Tanzania to begin with. Uh, and then in the future, we are going to do digital payments as well for Tanzania, and then we'll expand to Kenya and then other African countries. Uh, we have over 18,000 users. We have uh, paying users. And recently we raised over 200,000 uh, euros from Startup Wise Guys and other investors. We are currently raising a million euros for, uh, for pre-seed round. And yes, this is the team that built Tunza, and we invite people to become Tanzanians. Thank you. Winola, fantastic, great presentation. Um, thank you so much and congrats on what you've built so far. We'll go ahead and open up for questions from the media panel if uh, anybody wants to start us off. Please, Gina. Um, yeah, I'm just a little unclear on how uh, the business model works. So, 
um, do does it deduct a certain amount or do I put a certain amount um, towards application every month or how, how does it work? Can you explain that more clearly? Okay, um, it's quite easy how our product works. Um, so first of all, we don't take money uh, from your account. You have to author authorize the transaction. And so let's say you want to buy a, a new mobile phone. You come to Tunza, you pick this product. Let's say this phone costs a thousand dollars. And then once you do this, you say, I'm going to be able to pay this for six months. So the reason we are not doing um, automated transactions that we are not taking money from your account is because our target group earns in small amounts. Yeah, most people have informal jobs. That's the 80% of earners in Africa. And so we give them freedom to pay whenever they're ready to pay. So within six months, we divide this $1,000, for example, into small amounts. And then um, consumers can pay with mobile money at any time that they want to, to do this. And as soon as they finish the payments, that's when we deliver the product to them. OK. Um, and how do you guarantee that they're going to make payments in a certain month if you're not automatically deducting it? Or what if they don't? Well, well, if they don't, uh, the risk on our side is minimum because, well, we, we are not giving them the product in advance. They pick right. the product once they finish paying. And also we have policies that allow people to, um, if they want to change the product, they can change. Um, if they also want to ask for a refund, of course, we take an amount if they, uh, they want to, to, to cancel. But um, the fact that uh, we don't take money automatically gives them freedom to basically pay um, based on how they're earning. So today, people, so you have a person that maybe today earns $10, after two days, they're making $20, so they can pay these small amounts as they go. But it's very interesting because we see people who start with very small amounts, I'm talking $1, and then they finish paying for products with $500. And this in Africa is a lot of money. Yeah, no, it sounds really interesting. I haven't heard of something like that before. Uh, I just have one more question. What kind of merchants are you working with? Okay, um, so we have um, people who are selling uh, products, uh, you know, such as tangible products like phones, um, suppliers of, um, you know, kitchenware, books, books are the top selling products, and even travel companies. So maybe in the future we'll work with flapping when they plan to expand to Africa. So um, this allows us to basically um, give our API uh, to different merchants uh, who can um, integrate it either on their platforms or they can sell it within our marketplace. And this allows us to basically work with anyone as long as they are registered and um, um, we vet them to make sure that they provide the actual service that they say they do. And then at the end of the day, uh, we can onboard any of them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Tell Thanks. me about your, uh, about your due diligence and, and, uh, and uh, benchmarking here against the competition. You're picking on, not, I shouldn't say picking on, you are picking out a very economically underserved population that needs this type of e-commerce uh, e-commerce connection. But you know what? Uh, the mobile penetration rate is going to vary exceedingly by by the, the markets you're after here. You've got rural versus you've got rural versus urban, and you know not everybody has access to a mobile phone, even though that might be a high penetration rate in the markets you serve. So, what I'd like to kind of ask you here is how are you going to go about consumer effective, intelligent, transparent consumer marketing to educate people who might be a little untrustworthy of this kind of technology because frankly, they don't have access to it, let alone money to spend. So that's a big, that's a big, uh, that's a big challenge, I would think, for a startup like you. How are you going to deal with it? That's a brilliant question, Mark. I was hoping somebody would ask this. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you can see the current slide that I'm showing. But um, our technology works offline. So what we did um, last year, we had people asking these questions, how can we trust you? And so, well, I said, let's build a physical space because currently this is how it works in Africa and Asia and so many other countries. People go to physical shops, um, they put the money aside and then they buy products. So this is what we did in Tanzania. We set up a pilot, um, a pilot shop and we put their tablets and uh, free internet and some of the products. And we have an attendant there. So people come to our shop, they're asking questions about Tunza, we give them information. And the fact that they can speak to someone is building trust. So they come, um, 
we have people who came to our shop without a smartphone. They set, they set up an order and they go back home and they can continue to pay without needing internet. That's the beauty of mobile payment. And so they are using um, USSD codes, um, you know, uh, you know, they dial up the code, you don't need an internet to do this. And then they start to make these payments while they're at home. And so we have seen people who, we have converted them from non-smartphone users to um, smartphone users as their first product on Tunza. And now they're buying more products and now they're much more comfortable. And what's interesting is that they can tell their friends, hey, you know, you can go to this shop. So the plan that we have, because um, I'm not sure, um, but for people who understand mobile payment, how it works, um, they have small kiosks all over um, the, the countries from Kenya, Tanzania. And so our plan in the future is to work um, with these um, with these kiosks to basically um, convert them to sort of like last mile delivery, but also training points for Tunza. So when they go out to withdraw money for mobile payment, they can also learn about Tunza and then they can set up orders in these physical spaces with the plan that of course in the future, um, the, the, the internet penetration is, is growing very strong in Africa. And so in the future, we, we, we will see um, digital transformation for our users. And this is why we're also building digital products for the businesses, because they also need this side to be able to manage um, their products. So this is our plan for the people who do not have smartphone and internet access to currently use physical uh, spaces, and then in the future to convert them to our digital our platform and it's working it's working people are coming and then they're buying in um in this physical space and then they get products from tunza thank you yes, um, Ivan. we have time for one very quick question and we're all a one very quick answer if you wanted to yeah uh i i wanted to ask what's the incentive for users here because uh like do you provide any interest or do you provide any rewards because a lot of time this is in 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 like in a, in a rough analogy this is a reverse emi play right because people are not buying the product and then paying in installments you are asking them to pay installments up front and get the product when they pay the whole amount so rather than me having the product i'll have to wait for it so what's the incentive for me here uh, as a consumer rewards one of the biggest feature for tunza is gamification and in this and when we do gamification we try to convert their financial habits in the process so by doing so um every time they are paying for these products um we we track um their payments and then in the future we know okay this user we can give them a certain reward that they can um, claim on our platform or on some of the shops that we are partnering with tunza so this is how we incentivize our users Alrighty, Winola. Well, thank you very much and great presentation and congrats on everything you've built. Thank you. All right, folks, we'll move along. Uh, we'll bring up next uh, Stan, uh, who is the VP of product marketing at Local Express. Stan, give me one second and I'll pass you the presenter role. Okay. All righty. All right, you should be able to share your screen stand okay. okay sorry i have a sudden power outage so i'm calling in through hotspot so hopefully my connection isn't too slow so uh, once again, my name is Stan Bian from uh, Local Express. Our founders founded our company uh, back in 2017 when Amazon acquired Whole Foods with a lot of independent grocery grocers about Amazon coming to the grocery market space. So what happened to uh, Barnes and Noble and um, and the Circus City don't happen to them. So that was the the, the impetus for starting the company and. Uh, and then I'm, I'm sure people are tired of talking about it, but pandemic happened. And then that really accelerated the growth of the, the grocery uh, e-commerce industry. Um, so what they were expecting uh, a gradual growth, but pandemic really uh, accelerated the growth, uh, you know, really the five years worth of growth into five months during the peak of the pandemic. And now that uh, there were some concerns that 
e-commerce and grocery will go away after a pandemic, but it hasn't. It's continued to grow. Actually, uh, companies like Walmart, who has a very high percentage of grocery sales and Target and Kroger, they, they see e-commerce and omnichannel as the main driver of growth for those companies. So with pandemic, the, not only the stores, but the shoppers or the consumers' uh, shopping habits have changed. So now people are more, especially in the U.S., people are more uh, uh, ready to buy, purchase food and uh, groceries online. 70% uh, of the Americans have, uh, American household have tried ordering um, groceries online. Most people are purchasing groceries via app, which is new. When co consumers buy, they tend to buy in bulk. So uh, the basket sizes are two to four times bigger than the, uh, what, when they, what they would purchase in the store. And, uh, but as, the, the, as the, uh, the industry is expanding and growing, people want more out of the grocery e-commerce like they're used to from the other e-commerce in the retail. So, so this is the challenges that independent grocers are uh, dealt with. So, but they have to respond now. It's not going to go away. So, but they have their own challenges, such as uh, building the system. Grocers are, you know, grocers. They they sell food. They're not technology experts. So they don't know too much about this uh, the technology. If they want to build it, it will be very expensive. And uh, so they have. So each solution was to go to third party marketplaces like Instacart and others but they charge very high fees. So it, honestly, once again, during the pandemic, that was acceptable, but now that people are understanding the business and it's not gonna, gonna go away, they have to uh, figure out a better way to uh, make it more economical and make profit. And uh, the worst part about the third party marketplaces, they're not, uh, they don't share custom, uh, data about their customers. So over time you're losing uh, touch with your customers and understand understanding of your customers. So we provided uh, omni-channel solutions uh, uh, to to meet their needs. So of course you get the e-commerce and the, the app, uh, very highly personal personal pers personal sizable, <laughs> uh, omni-channel, uh, very high tech fulfillment uh, capabilities, because they're realizing one of the biggest component of. Uh, uh, cost of the online delivery is picking and packing the order, and then of course the actual delivery, and then we have all seconds. The other automation like uh, um, 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 a kiosk. So we have we provide basically tools to help you uh, support the uh, give you the technology to make your life easier, make the process more streamlined for you that builds more loyalty to the customers, uh, increase your profit, and then um, a subscription fee. Um, and then and we have a la carte based pricing. So they pay only what they need. And uh, of course the, the industry is huge globally. The, uh, the grocery um, e-commerce industries is $80 billion. And the time. All right, um, Stan, thank you very much um, for, for the presentation as well. And, um, you know, sorry about the, um, um, the, the power issues, the connectivity issues as well, um, but I, 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 we did have you come through. So thank you very much, you. Stan, okay. for a great presentation. Um, we'll go ahead and open up for questions. And I see Stefania already has her hand raised, so we'll start with you. Hi, Stan. Oh, nice to meet you. Um, you mentioned on your presentation that after the pandemic, this market uh, grew more. And I wanted to know what is that plus that you're offering to the consumers that makes you stand out from the rest of the competitors in your market? Yeah, so we offer to a store what we call the, you know, their, their own branded store and app. So uh, you know, if you're on Instacart, the consumers have to go to Instacart, find your store and buy. With our solution, basically you have your own very highly personalized website that's with your, all your great images and, uh, and you get your own branded app. Uh, but also we offer solutions like uh, in-store kiosk. So we, we're trying to bring technology that is like uh, Gap, omni-channel, like you could buy in store or online, and you could go uh, uh, talk to people at store and return, and all that, all, all those technologies and processes that you need, uh, we provide the system for it. Thank you. 
would you rifle shot your value prop for me? I mean, you've got excellent market research, and I like how you're presenting here, but I'm not seeing what's different here. So rifle shot, exactly what makes you different, would you? Well, yeah, so so you, you, you're able to brand your own uh, website and app, and then our cost is much cheaper because our um, you only pay fixed monthly fee versus a small uh, nominal transaction fee versus competition who charges up to 30% of the, you know, the consumer purchase. So, you know, as the e-commerce, uh, more people order online for groceries. I mean, groceries known for a very slim margin on, on, on their profit. So if they're giving 30% to uh, the third party marketplace provider, they just can't make money, you know, and they're not. And uh, so with our, there's a, a changes going on, uh, understanding that stores need to take more ownership of this uh, process and experience for with their customers. So they're taking some of the uh, pick pack uh, process themselves, that they're uh, doing the delivery themselves, some of them. So I think that trend is going to pick up and there's already some discussion in the industry regarding that. So we could, we, we give you control over your process and, and do it much more uh, economically. Thank you. Any other I'm questions? I'm sorry, I'm getting a lag. Any other questions for Stan? Yeah, a, a quick question. Uh, in, in terms of uh, increasing, uh, I, I would say, visitors or, or, or potential business increase uh, for local stores, what, what kind of change have you seen by them at adding your own their, you know, your delivery fleet uh, management? to their app or solution, given that, you know, like, I mean, I don't live in the US, but I would go to my nearest store and buy something, but I'm not sure if I, if they have an app and they offer something that my local store doesn't, uh, then they might have a better chance at having me as a customer versus visiting. Okay, so, yeah, so, um... As a, as a, if I were a store owner, I would want to have control over my you know, store brand online or you know in store. So it's just running a, a business, but uh, a second business, second store uh, online. So you have to still do promotion. You have to do marketing. Uh, we don't we don't you know we we give you tools to you know uh, built in tools to market efficiently to your customer. We help you build your database of your customers understand that behavior and market to them directly. Um, and then we, uh, you know, we provide delivery network. We don't do delivery ourselves. Right. And, you know, you can pick and choose the lowest provider in that area. So we give you control to uh, manage your cost. Right. And one quick thing is, is that, yeah, the market, if the order goes to marketplace, you, you don't have control over your customer. No, no, no. You don't know what, what's what happening. I'm, what I'm, Sorry, what I'm saying is what kind of difference have you seen in terms of uh, customer retention versus new customers when they switch to your solution versus they were using something else? Oh, okay. So I'm mean, sorry. In terms of numbers. Okay. Yeah, we we have uh, yeah, so we have customers. If customers are uh, the store is motivated to grow their online business, we have lots of success stories. But we, you know, we have of course customers that just going online means that they're going to get uh, sales, then, you know, those guys uh, aren't very successful, but we have, you know, a, a good example, one butcher shop. We're very, uh, we have a lot of butcher shops in our platform and they do like, uh, you know, get a lot of orders through our system and they switch from one of our competitors and they're very happy. So if you, it's they, they have to buy in that this is important for their business. If they think it's going to go away, then yeah, we can't help them. But if they think this is an important part of their business, we have all the tools and, and and things needed for them to succeed. And we have a lot of case studies. And then we we don't just serve uh, in, in the small one, mom and pop stores. We also have a, a sixty store chains uh, that are on our platform. The high volumes, so yeah. But it's independent. They're regional, but still independent. They're competing with the nationals in the Amazons. 
Right, Stan. Well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation and for being here with us today. Uh, I know you're on a very tight schedule as well, so if you have to, have to hop off, no worries, but I uh, really appreciate you coming here to present and connect. Thank you. All right, Stan. Um, next up, we'll bring up Kyle Kaiser, CEO of Our Forest. Kyle, give me one second and I'll pass you the presenter role, sir. And I'll yes. also take right. this time uh, just really quickly for a quick PSA. Uh, judges, if you could remember to be scoring in real time uh, so that we can announce a winner at the end because we're creeping up on the end of the competition. All right, Kyle, you should be able to share your screen at this point. Are you able to do so? Uh, no, not yet. Sorry I'm about that. Disabled for spin screens. Yeah. Okay, not let me yet. try that again. How about now? Perfect. All right. All right, there we go. Can you see that? Yes, sir. And here you loud and clear too. So whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Kyle. I'm the founder of our forest. And in just the last year and a half, we've already planted over 941,000 trees. We're pretty excited about. Um, but right now, I'm chatting with you because you can feel this shift that's happening in the world. It's about customers and employees. They're increasingly choosing brands and companies that share their values and are proving they care about more than just the bottom line. They care about the world we live in. So why is this happening? Well, it's these two big problems that we're facing as humans. It's climate change. It's the accelerating loss of biodiversity. And it's becoming a really big problem. So what can we actually do about this? We know one of the key parts of the solution is planting trees. It helps with climate change by capturing and storing CO2, and it helps with biodiversity by creating important wildlife habitat. So if companies know that their customers and their team would like this, why aren't more of them planting trees? The problem is it's hard. It takes time, energy, and the attention of their team away from what they're working on. They have to partner with organizations, track how many trees to plant, verify they're actually being planted, measure and report the impact, as well as communicate the initiative to their customers across their website, product packaging, social, and more. This is where we come in. We make it easy, automatic, and impactful. We have integrations to get rid of all the manual work. We have a complete marketing toolkit, with things like a personalized profile, and even the ability for their customers to choose where the trees get planted and get updates. We also provide accountability that the trees are being planted and offer sample pricing of just 33 cents per tree. The market for e-commerce and by extension digital payments is large, it's growing, and the shift towards sustainability and environmentally positive things is the massive movement we see occurring here. So I'll leave you with this question. What if every transaction helped restore nature? Just think about the impact that would make for our planet and how it would positively impact our future. Thanks for your time. Awesome, Kyle. Great presentation uh, and really cool work that you guys are doing too. So congrats. Thank you. All right, folks, we'll open up for questions for Kyle. Um, if anybody wants to go first. Victor, Gina, Navanita, anybody have a question for yeah, Kyle? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so do you already have users? It's a very noble thought that you have, but I want to know like how many people are actually opting for this? I think we have about 85 companies right now, and uh, they've collectively planted nearly a million trees. Oh, that's good. Thank you. You buried, you buried the lead for me, which is that last slide is the one that gripped me. Why did you wait so long to do it that way? I mean, you know, yeah, you're, you're onto something here because green is in sustainability, but the thing is, you wait until the very end to kind of tell me that you got something different here. Expand upon that. How are you different? What's the value prop? I'm not Absolutely. Sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, apologies for that. <laughs> uh, you know, wanted to kind of lay the, the groundwork there um, and, and get everyone on the same page about why this is a, a movement um, that we can be a part of. With our product, what makes us different is a few things. One is we're very holistic. So we're not just planting the trees, but we're also looking at how can we make it so that this business actually engages their customer in the story and sells more of their products as a result and doesn't have to spend hours and hours recreating the wheel for things that other competitors, other companies have done. So if they're running a, a social campaign, they can actually uh, look and see this library, see examples, see what's going on, what other people have done, what works. If they are um, looking to do something on their website, we have all of those assets pre-made that they can just drop it on. And we also will do the setup for them uh, if they're not as tech friendly or their team's just really busy. And uh, we still have positive unit economics that way too. 
Very cool, Kyle. Um, I see Stefania with your hand up as well, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, hey, Kyle. Um, that's really impactful what you're doing, so congratulations on that. But I'm curious about knowing, like, what's your story? What's the background story uh, that made you, like, create this um, business model? Um, so I think it's a few things. One is an avid outdoorist. You know, I love hiking. I love traveling. I love nature. Uh, and I have been an entrepreneur for a while. Um, I started my first company like eight years ago. I went through the Y Combinator program. So I've kind of been through this, um, this process. I also uh, worked at Shopify as a product manager. So I've seen the whole e-commerce side of things and what's going on there. And so this was kind of just the perfect combination of everything that's going on, my passion, my experience, and just seeing the need and what was going on in the space. Thank you. Ivan, please. Uh, hey, Kyle, I, I just want to understand what's the customer onboarding and when, when I say customer company onboarding and experience in terms of when the tree plantation occurs. For instance, there is Ecosia, uh, which does plant tree when people start searching, right? So you mentioned e-commerce. So I wanted to understand like the, the business model part as well as the on onboarding part. For instance, if I'm, I'm in an online store and I want to participate on do I plant with every transaction? What is the cost to me? What is uh, what do you get if you can quickly explain on to that? Yeah, so another big part uh, of what makes us different is we're really flexible. And so we realized early on that every business was a little different. They all had slightly different needs. So we let them choose what makes the most sense. Our most, comular, uh, most common uh, models are one tree per order. So it's a very simple one, very easy to understand. Uh, to offset the carbon of delivery. So that's one that also kind of ha makes sense. Sometimes they'll do per product sold, especially if they're you know bigger products and they have the margin, or they might do multiple per product sold. Uh, and then the last one is a percentage of revenue. So it's kind of whatever makes the most sense for the business. But I'd say the most common is either one tree per order or to offset delivery. And what fees do you take uh, from those? So our... Um, you know, different tree planting organizations have different costs. And so we're aiming to be about 20% margin. The truth is right now we're quite a bit higher than that, but as we expand to more over time, we'll probably zero in on that. Uh, so the 33 cents per tree also has our costs uh, incorporated into it. Got it. And very quick follow-up. What's, what's the ARR uh, for this financial year? Um, like the, the ARR looking forward, I yeah. think it would, what would it be? If, if you have a it's previous about, figure, so, so. Yeah, it's, I guess it would be a little like around 200,000, uh, 220,000, something like that. That's cool. Thanks. All right, folks. Well, Kyle, great presentation uh, and great on what you're doing as well. I'm not sure if you included it in the, um, uh, in the pitch. Um, but as well, I, I think it's a great fact to know that you went through Y Combinator for a previous um, uh, startup and you also worked at Shopify, those types of things as well, um, really kind of lend you a lot of credibility. So um, again, congratulations and great presentation. Thank you. All right. So we are uh, reached the end of our uh, competition and we have one more presenter. Um, really quickly, judges, uh, a quick reminder, if you could please fill out the judge's scorecard so we can announce a winner at the end. Um, patiently waiting, uh, and last but not least, we have Emery, who's the co-founder uh, and CEO of Pivany. Uh, I'll go ahead and give you the presenter role and bring Thank you me. up on screen. Thank you so much for joining us and, and waiting patiently as well. Thank you. All right, you should be able to share your screen when you're ready. Okay, can I see now? Yes, sir. Okay, I have a problem with um, slideshow, so I'll go over this uh, through this okay. view. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emre, co-founder and CEO of Pivony. Um, on Pivony, we help brands see the opportunities in the market. Yes. Nowadays, consumers have more options than ever in online marketplaces. There, there's a variety of products under 
each category is in online marketplaces, but on the brand side, they are not very certain about what makes a product top seller or uh, what are the most critical insights they can get to develop to develop new generations of products. So we built Pivani for B2C brands and we had them to obtain a holistic view of the whole um, end consumer conversations in less than 30 minutes. So they can see customer retention areas, market opportunities uh, in a self-service experience. Let's look at an example. And this Ninja Air Fryer is the top seller in its category. And all you need to do is to give the link to Pivony and click on submit button. And in less than 30 uh, minutes, our AI engine um, discovers the contextual groups of the end consumer conversations. So some part of conversations are related to buying factors related to the customer experience, like people are enjoying to uh, you know, cook wing chicken and they think it's very easy to clean up the machine. But also there are some improvement areas like rubber smell, plastic smell, and so on. On top of that, we allow brands to turn these customer conversations into KPIs and set alerts. So I'm Emre, co-founder and CEO, and Rehab is my tech co-founder. And we are already a part of startup ecosystem, including we received a pre-seed investment from Startup Wise Guys. And we continuously join to many organizations, uh, awards, and so on. Thank you for listening, and let's accelerate Pivini's growth together. Awesome, Emery. Uh, congratulations on your guys' growth so far as well, Thank uh, you. and great presentation. Uh, we'll open up for questions from the media panel. Um, sure. I uh yeah i uh i wanted to know um so uh when we talk about this uh is it real-time nlp analysis that that you're doing or what is your model for uh, data collection and analysis um thank you for this question so uh, when you create the dashboard for a certain product or for a certain category or in the online marketplace you give the time range so you can say let's take the reviews since last six months um, and then it keeps updating the dashboard with the most fresh data. And uh, it's not limited to the old conversations, but also we do early topic detection. So whenever there is a new type of conversation pattern appears in consumer reviews, we uh, pop up this and then inform the, uh, inform the users. So it's uh, the combination of past historical data and the new uh, dynamic data. Right. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how are you um, earning from this? Are you partnering? You must be partnering with the sellers, right? Is this like, um, like SaaS? Or? It's a SaaS product and we directly work with brands. Uh, and these brands have, they are selling their products directly. They have some online shops or they are selling through sellers. Uh, but since this type of insights is, uh, they are very useful also for product development, quality, after sales, and many other departments. Uh, we directly work with uh, brands with a yearly subscription model. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Emre? Uh, yeah, Victor, yeah. please. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so another thing I have in mind that see uh, the analysis that you are providing, I can't get I can get it from you know let's say a Tableau or or other softwares. So what makes your analysis really really different from what my team or other teams that are present can do in you know have a team and do and hire you guys for doing it? Okay. So first of all, I'm just only um, showcasing the e-commerce part of our platform, but we are an omni-channel product platform. So we do analysis of social media or MPS surveys as well. And for each data stream, we have uh, special models trained with only e-commerce data, for instance, like sentiment models trained with e-commerce data. Also in terms of category discovery, topic detection, 
we train it only with e-commerce data because every type of consumer opinion is unique to its uh, you know data stream people talk very differently on twitter for instance so uh, in tableau yes you can do some data visualizations but in terms of how actionable the insights you get out of the platform uh, i can say there is a need for such a product And I think I might have cut you off, Ivan, if you had a question. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I, I quickly wanted to ask what you showed was like a word cloud generation based on reviews. Uh, like you told Victor that you have more sentiment analysis tools, but uh, as, as a seller, how many, like what input do I need to give? Because in your demo, you said that I need to put Amazon link, right? Uh, now, I, I could be selling on multiple platforms and people could be talking about my product on multiple platforms if you have that. So as a seller, how much is my input to get sentiment analysis of my product? Um, so I need to repeat the question to be okay. sure that I understood it correctly. So as a seller, you want to be sure that how much efforts you should give. Uh, to set up and start to use uh, the product. Right? Basically, you see, see your your demo showed that I need to input the Amazon link. Uh -huh. uh, how many links do I need to put? Like, do I need to put every platform do I sell in? Uh, and if so, like, how does your tool go to Twitter and connect? Uh, like, do you do a word search? Do you do sentiment analysis? on that cloud, how many platforms do you search across? Mm -hmm. So there is social media, uh, Facebook page reviews, um, Instagram owned comments, DM inboxes, internal data. Also, if you sell on multiple marketplaces, you can also uh, include all of these links. Also, if you sell on different countries marketplaces, let's say Amazon, US, UK, Germany, you can also add them all and then the um, our AI uh, algorithms, for instance, detects German language and processes based on that uh, language, you know, uh, grammar and so on. I, I understood that, but my question was that, why do I need to put so many links in? Why you are you're doing the heavy lifting for the Facebook page, etc. If I'm putting one Amazon link, uh, why is your algorithm not picking up where else am I selling this? Yeah, that, that, that can be a, uh, an improvement area in our roadmap for sure. Uh, yeah. we, we started with that, you know, it's a starting point, but we can definitely improve that. Thank you for this suggestion. All righty, Emery. Well, uh, congratulations on what you guys have built so far and for joining us Thank today. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, um, we're at the end of the competition. We're going to uh, finalize the score. So judges, if you could please just take the next 20 or 30 seconds or so to make any last minute changes. Um, and then we'll go ahead and have uh, my colleague Shaban uh, announce the winners for everybody. Uh, but did want to just take this time uh, to say, you know, thank you to all the startup founders that came on and did this. It's, it's definitely not easy. So all of you guys um, deserve a big round of applause uh, today. And also another big thank you um, to our special guest who took time out of his day and, and stayed with us too. Um, so uh, Sajid Mohammadi, thank you so much for, um, for sticking around and, and supporting uh, today. Um, and then media judges, I wanna mention um, if, if anybody right now has any questions for the media panel, um, now is a really good time to ask. Um, and this could be specific to your startup um, or it could be kind of in general about any kind of media best practices. Um, oftentimes, I think for founders, the media can kind of be a black box. I don't really understand what makes a story interesting to a reporter, that sort of thing. So if anybody likes, has a question, uh, we can open up and ask a couple right now. Don't be shy either. All right, I, I see Kyle. Thank you for being brave, Kyle. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, so we haven't raised investment yet. Should we do media and press coverage before, during, or after doing a round of investment? Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a, little, a little advice here. 
And this is the dinosaur speaking. But I go back to the beginning of e-commerce, B2C and B2B. I've covered 6,000 startups across all the spaces imaginable. So first off, you're a winner. But here's my point. Get a case study. You want to influence the press. You want to get a guy like me to write about you. Don't just give me the elevator pitch. You, you hooked me with that last slide of yours. But the thing is, you bury the lead. So get a case study and then pitch the media with, I have something that's all about sustainability and profitability and it's different e-commerce and I got a partner who's going to talk to you and both of us. That's what's going to hook you, I think. You need that before you go to the VCs because the VCs want proof positive that you're getting that you're out there building brand awareness. So that's one trick of the trade. That's great feedback, Mark. And I'm actually curious to hear if uh, Ivan um, or Victor have any response as well, because I know their publications tend to cover um, venture rounds as well. You know, Ivan, is it too early to reach out to a tech crunch if you haven't raised um, funding yet? And we, we do cover consumer facing startups. Uh, I mean, I, I, I get that Kyle, the, the media pitch is pretty attractive given that is environment, but, but certain publications might cover it uh, given that. And, and, and like, like Mark rightly said, get uh, case studies in because this is, because this is, you're working in environment, a lot of uh, publications writing about this might not really care about the fact that you haven't raised venture, uh, venture round, uh, but certain publications like we might care about it depending on the reporter and depending on the stage and like what we hear more from you when we talk to you. But given the pitch and given the slant that you have, I, I'm pretty sure I I don't think so. There would be a lot of problem in getting coverage uh, for this if you build your deck or build a pitch properly in that sense. And, and Kyle, to piggyback off that as well, I, I think um, obviously you, you have to study uh, up on, on the publications you're pitching where um, like a digital commerce, commerce 360 um, who is very uh, niche into, into e-commerce, right? Um, and they're, they're going to want to know a little bit more of the um, kind of the, like he said, the traction, the, um, the, the case study, maybe you can put them in touch with uh, an end user um, so they can talk about how your um, company works. Whereas another publication, whether maybe it's a local publication in, um, in, in the state where you're at, um, they might be interested in you because you're a founder that went to the high school in, 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 you know, in this state. So I think it's kind of like finding the right angle for also for the right publication, of course. And for all um, you folks, for all you folks out there, build your brand, get on industry panels, become a thought leader in your niche. And guess what? The money will follow once you get the buy-in from the audience you seek to, to go after. So you know, be be your own best friend, but you know, become a thought leader, and that's going to help you get a lot of attention you might have thought otherwise. And the other thing too is, if you haven't got a blog on your website, start one and make it count because you never know it's going to bubble up to the uh, in, in SEO rankings or Google rankings these days. You know what? I troll every day for really good stories that might grip my interest. And if you're out there with a hell of a good blog with some good stats and a good case study, you might hear me knocking. So just a couple of tricks to trade from uh, from uh, the old school guy here. <laughs> awesome, Mark. Uh, I see uh, when Nola has his hand raised too, if you have a question. Um, yes, how, uh, my question is, um, how do I navigate in um, international media, especially when the focus is to currently, you know, grow in a local market, especially from Tanzania, which is not very famous for, you know, tech products. So how does a startup like Tunza navigate in these waters? Anybody want to field that one? Um, I can sort of probably start off. Um, I mean, I think we cover a lot of international startups and we cover a lot of international retailers. And I think that in itself, what you just said, is a good pitch that there is not a lot of um, other companies doing what you're doing uh, in the region that you are. And there are not a lot of companies doing that even the U.S. That, as far as I know of. Um, so you're sort of just like starting um, a new idea up that can inspire, you know, other companies across the world. So I think 
that in itself is a great pitch if you're pitching to international media. And I think it also brings awareness in terms of diversity, because um, uh, even today we don't have a lot of black people and people of color um, when it comes to the startup industry. Um, um, and they're not receiving, uh, they don't receive as, as much capital as most um, white men do when it comes to, you know, startups. Um, so I think that in itself is a great way to sort of pitch your company when it comes to international publications, or at least that's something that I know that we care about at Morning Group. Right, Lashana. Uh, yeah, it's nice if you come to me with a great story, but then I, we tell great e-commerce stories to live a long day. But you know what, what's more important? Uh, Tanzania, I'll talk about that for just a sec here. Go and find out who are the leading trade publications in that, in that, in that niche you want and there, and then either you pitch them or have your PR guys pitch them because that's the exposure you want. Why? Because you build your brand there. And more importantly, that is where the audience is gonna resonate because, oh, look at this unique startup for the payments they wanna do. So uh, rifle shot it and think local, my friends. Everything international is always began with a local experience. So go after the regional pubs first and I think you'd be just fine. And to follow up on what Mark says as well, I think a lot of the large um, um, business publications like Business Insider, Forbes, et cetera, they also have regional um, arms to those publications as well. We actually hosted uh, Chinecharem and Nenduka from um, Business Insider Africa on a couple of um, uh, Connect events ago. Um, so a, a, another way to kind of get in uh, to that um, um, kind of that to that niche as well in terms of the business publications, get there. And then, and um, of course, after that, you can also share that with um, kind of reporters going forward if you're looking to contact American media or European media and, and, and let them know that, hey, you know, Business Insider covered me uh, here in Africa as well, that sort of thing. So. And, and and to that point, like reporters, African reporters working for international publications, like we have two reporters working there, they are better people, if not to cover, to give uh, your startup a, a, the understanding of local context when presenting it to the global uh, media in, or global audience in certain sense. If you have one or two of those articles out, see the other media who might not be aware about your local context will follow in certain sense if they find the story interesting. Uh, thanks a lot for the feedback. Yes, we, um, we did um, one interview with the Chuvele, DW, and some uh, media companies that reached out, but it's always like tricky. What do I say in international platforms versus you know um, local reporters? But thanks a lot for the feedback. Right, no, great question too, Enola. Um, uh, really quickly, judges, have we finalized our scores? All good? Mark? Victor, all right. All right, cool. Um, well, I think we have time uh, for, for one more question and then we'll announce the, uh, the winner. So anybody else have a quick question for the media panel? Yes, I have a quick question. So actually we've signed a big customer in uh, Latin America and we're trying to do uh, some push into the Latin America publications uh, on food. I mean, we know there's a Besto, which is a big kind of the dual uh, uh, grocery focused publication here. But yeah, I mean, we, we're looking for some, um, you know, avenues to expand our reach to Latin, Latin um, grocery tech publications. No, for sure. I, I mean, maybe it's Stefania, do you have any um, uh, kind of thoughts on e expanding into a new market, specifically LATAM, maybe in terms of how journalism and and, and how pitching journalists in, in LATAM differs from uh, maybe in the United States? I think um, LATAM market has like, go, I guess grown a lot. And uh, we can see a lot of diversity uh, when it comes to people and, and the market itself. Um, so I would say, like, um, do some research first 
to know how maybe what you're selling um, is uh, how how it's here and how it's um, and like how it's presented to the media and what kind of um, publications are better suited for what you're offering and if there are any Latin business models that are like um, re related to what you do or similar to what you do and reach out to them. Uh, so yeah, that, that would be what I have to say. I think from our experience um, as well, kind of at Publicize, we, we, we do work with a number of like American clients as well that are interested in, in, in LATAM. For, for me on my side, um, um, I would say just kind of, and it, 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 it kind of goes, um, if, if you were looking to identify publications in the US, identify a competitor and do a quick Google news search and see who's covered them. And odds are that they might be interested in covering you. Obviously you need to tell them kind of what differentiates you. Um, I would say also, it's been our experience that especially in LATAM, um, journalists tend to like um, um, either speaking over WhatsApp or phone calls versus email. And I think in the United States and, and um, you know, maybe Mark um, and Gina, you can um, attest to this, but I think it's probably preferred uh, to at least initially um, contact over email versus, versus phone. Uh, for most U.S. reporters, but we found in in Latin Latin America, it really is welcomed to to have a phone call. Thank you. Sure thing. All right, guys, uh, we do have our uh, winners. So uh, apologies for the delay on uh, tallying the votes, but they were so darn close uh, that it took us another round of counting. But we do have them, and to announce them, I want to bring on my colleague Siobhan Parnell. Um, Siobhan will go on and call out the third, second, and first place winners. Um, we'll go ahead and I ask everybody to unmute so we can give them a big round of applause and show some support. Um, and then uh, if you're announced as, as one of the third, second, or first place winners, if you wanted to say something really quickly um, as well, we're happy to bring you on. So uh, Siobhan, uh, without any further ado, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Jim. And um, just want to say congratulations to all the startups because they were five really excellent pitches. Um, but we have uh, we have selected a winner, uh, what the judges have. Um, so in third place, um, we have Flappin. All right, Paul, congratulations. Yeah. Hey, Paul, not bad for uh, your first uh timeout pitching getting third place ain't bad sir so congratulations thank you i'm glad congratulations paul um so now in second place and um, it was very close um we have tons up congratulations thank awesome. you Nola. congrats winola thank you thank you so much yeah, thanks for being here with us. Okay, All and right. fin finally, um, the the winner of Connect Ecommerce and Web Development in first place, we have Al Forest. All right, Kyle. Nicely done, Kyle. Congrats. Congratulations, Kyle. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, Kyle, congratulations okay. on everything you've done. I'm not sure if you want to uh, yeah, say, say anything or t tell us how we can reach out and get, get to know you more. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, thank you so much for hosting this and for putting on this event. Uh, thank you to the judges uh, for all of your valuable advice and feedback. I was taking notes the whole time. And so I'm definitely going to be incorporating this into the pitch, into how we tell our story, and also how we're thinking about press, which is something completely new for me. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, you can connect with me uh, through my email. It's just kyle at ourforest.io. Uh, and yeah, I'll, uh, I'll send uh, probably most of you an invite on LinkedIn as well. It'd be great to connect there. And, um, you know, if you don't mind in the future, I'd love to maybe send some questions your way, uh, learn more from your experience, uh, especially as we gear up and go more into this press cycle, as well as if you know any businesses, anybody in the e-commerce space that wants to do something good for our planet, that wants to do something their customers will love, uh, then I'd really appreciate those introductions as well. Yeah, thanks again. Awesome, Kyle. Congratulations again, and thanks so much. 
Um, before we go, uh, I did want to just thank again um, our special guest, Sajid Mohammadi from Nisim. Um, thank you so much for the inspiring words at the beginning. Um, and thank you, you know, again, for taking time out of your day. I know you're super busy. So Sajid, thanks for being with us. No, oh, thank you. No, this is a pleasure. And it's awesome to see uh, these startups do this amazing work. So congratulations to all of you. Yeah, they did kick butt today, didn't they? Um, and thank you to all of our media judges, Ivan Mehta from TechCrunch, Victor Day from VentureBeat, Gina Sharma from Morning Brew. Gina, for the first time uh, being with us, so thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Uh, Mark Rowan as well. Thank you from Digital E-Commerce 360, Navanita from the Tech Panda, and Stefania from Entrepreneur Magazine in Espanol and, and Social Geek. Uh, really great lineup of media judges, so thank you all for being here. Uh, and last but not least, I'd also like to thank uh, my two colleagues, uh, Siobhan and Salome. Uh, they put all this together on, uh, on the back end. So thank you very much as well. And we hope to uh, host everybody for a next Connect event next month. And we'll see you then. Until then, take care. One, uh, one last thing. If yes, anybody wants some help, look me up on LinkedIn. You can find me easily enough. I run the biggest clearinghouse in e-commerce, and I love helping startups. So you can find me easily enough, look me up, and I'll see if I, if I can't help you out. Because good job. You're out there plugging away and doing it. Just keep after it. So, Awesome. Thanks for that, Mark. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again, and we'll see you next time.